Hello, I'm Eric from Strong Medicine. In today's episode of Intern Crash Course, I'm discussing acute atrial fibrillation, or AFib. The first thing to discuss is what exactly I mean by acute AFib. This is not a formal designation, but I would consider any of the following situations to fall into this category. AFib that's symptomatic, AFib that's associated with a rapid ventricular response, also known as RVR. There's no uniformly applied specific cutoff, but commonly rates of greater than around 110 to 120 while at rest receive the RVR label. And AFib with new hemodynamic complications, such as new onset heart failure. In short, acute AFib is any presentation of AFib that lands a patient in the ER. The remainder of this video will cover six primary questions that the clinician needs to answer when caring for a patient with acute AFib. Does the patient require either emergent or urgent cardioversion? Is this new onset AFib or an exacerbation of an established arrhythmia? What is the specific trigger for the arrhythmia and or poor rate control? That is, why is it happening at this specific moment? Does the patient require rate control? What is the anticoagulation plan? And last, should the patient be hospitalized? Let's start with cardioversion. Emergent electrical cardioversion is indicated in a patient with hemodynamic instability or active ischemia secondary to the AFib, where active ischemia is manifesting as angina-type pain at rest. The term emergent cardioversion here does not necessarily mean call code and shock the patient as quickly as humanly possible. Awake cardioversion is extremely unpleasant, and depending on the situation, there is often, though not always, adequate time to get anesthesia to the bedside and provide sedation first. Also, a word about hemodynamic instability in AFib. This is generally rare, and its presence suggests one of three explanations. The patient has pre-existing heart failure. There is a concurrent additional etiology of shock, such as an acute MI or volume depletion. Or the patient has pre-excitation, also known as Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, a consequence of which is extremely fast ventricular rates when in AFib. Urgent electrical or pharmacological cardioversion should be considered after assessment for left atrial thrombus in patients with acute decompensated heart failure debilitating symptoms, or a known onset less than 48 hours ago, particularly if it's a first occurrence due to a known temporary trigger. A quick word about what I mean by left atrial thrombus assessment. If a clot has formed in the left atrium while the patient has been in AFib, restoring sinus rhythm carries the risk of embolizing that thrombus, leading to a stroke or other embolic catastrophe. Outside of emergencies, Patients should only be cardioverted if the onset was less than 48 hours ago, they've been reliably anticoagulated for at least three weeks for either pre-existing AFib or another indication, or they first undergo a transesophageal echocardiogram to ensure no clot is present. A transthoracic echocardiogram is not sufficiently sensitive for this particular purpose. I'm going to consider the next two questions together. Is this new onset AFib, and is there a specific trigger for the episode to occur at this time? New onset AFib is often the consequence of long-standing heart failure, coronary artery disease, hypertension, or valvular heart disease, particularly mitral valve disease. Transient triggers for acute AFib include surgery, particularly cardiac surgery, a heart failure exacerbation, hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia, any infection, though anecdotally, pneumonia may be the infection most associated with AFib, a pulmonary embolism, an acute alcohol binge, acute ischemia, though this is relatively uncommon, and hyperthyroidism. AFib from hyperthyroidism usually but not always is associated with other hyperthyroid symptoms. Despite the widespread belief among doctors to the contrary, Moderate amounts of caffeine intake, such as a few cups of coffee, is not a trigger for AFib. In fact, evidence has shown that moderate amounts of caffeine may actually be protective against the development of AFib in the long term. Since I'm discussing triggers, 
this is a good time to mention that not every patient who presents to the ED with rapid AFib needs an inpatient echo. Appropriate indications for an inpatient echo include a first episode of AFib, new onset concurrent heart failure, and suspected new onset ischemia. Additionally, a TEE is indicated, as mentioned, if needed to rule out the presence of a left atrial thrombus prior to cardioversion. The next question is whether or not the patient requires rate control. If the patient is symptomatic from a fast rate, the answer is easy, yes. But it's a little less clear if the patient is asymptomatic. How fast does an asymptomatic tachycardia need to be before pharmacologic intervention, and how urgent is that intervention? Well, it depends. It depends on the patient, their age, comorbidities, and whether there was a transient trigger for either the AFib or for the fast rate, which could be treated directly. If the decision is made that rate control of some kind is necessary, what are some initial options? Probably the most common one, at least in U.S. emergency rooms, is IV diltiazem. It has a rapid onset and is rapidly titratable. It's easy to transition to an oral regimen, and it's generally considered the most effective option for achieving immediate rate control. Since diltiazem is a negative inotrope, its major contraindication is acute decompensated heart failure. Typical initial doses range from 5 to 20 milligrams, which can be repeated, if necessary, after 15 minutes. I personally do not recommend more than 10 milligrams for the initial dose, since it's rapidly acting, and since you can always give more, but you can't take back what's already been given. However, I know other clinicians who routinely use doses up to 20. If the rate responds to the IV DILT, it can be followed by a continuous infusion starting at 5 mg per hour, titratable up to a max of 15 mg per hour. The next option is oral diltiazem. This is nice because it is extremely easy to transition the patient to an outpatient regimen. Once again, acute heart failure is a contraindication. A common starting dose is 30 mg Q6 hours of immediate release. Once an effective dose is established, it can be converted to once daily extended release upon discharge or even before discharge if a prolonged hospitalization for an unrelated reason is anticipated. Another option is IV metoprolol. It's easy to transition the patient to oral metoprolol, and in the long term, it's beneficial for patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, what was previously known as systolic heart failure. In the short term, however, it is contraindicated in acute decompensated heart failure. Also, as a beta blocker, it is relatively contraindicated in patients with COPD or acute bronchospasm. Typical initial doses are 2.5 to 5 milligrams, which can be repeated every 10 to 20 minutes to a max total dose of 15. If the heart rate has been successfully lowered with that, it can be converted immediately to oral metoprolol, though it can also be given as IVQ6 if the patient is unable to take oral medications. Esmolol is another IV beta blocker that has an unusually rapid onset and is very rapidly titratable due to its short half-life. There is no oral form of esmolol, so transitioning to an outpatient regimen isn't quite as clear as with other options in the chart. Its contraindications are the same as metoprolol. When using it for AFib, it's typical to start with a loading dose of 500 micrograms per kilogram over one minute, followed by a continuous infusion at 50 micrograms per kg per minute, which can be titrated upwards to a max dose of 200 micrograms per kilogram per minute. For patients presenting with both rapid AFib and acute decompensated heart failure in whom immediate electrical cardioversion is not necessary, amiodarone is the best choice. One potential disadvantage is that it risks conversion to sinus rhythm, which may not be desirable if the patient might have a left atrial clot. IV amio can cause hypotension. And although it's not relevant for short-term IV use, the long-term oral use of amio carries risk of many toxicities. The contraindications were already mentioned. IV amio is typically initiated as a 150 mg bolus over 10 minutes, followed by 1 mg per minute for 6 hours, and then followed by 0.5 mg per minute. The final conventional option for acute rate control is digoxin, which can be given by either IV or oral routes. 
The dioxin has the slowest onset of action of those meds listed, and rate control is most prominent only when the patient is at rest. Thus, it's generally considered a third-line agent for most patients after calcium channel blockers and beta blockers, but it doesn't cause hypotension and is not contraindicated in heart failure. Regarding contraindications, it's renally excreted and has a relatively narrow therapeutic window, meaning it's best to avoid in patients with renal failure. Loading of digoxin is usually done with three divided doses over 12 hours, with adjustments for abnormal renal function, for which I would recommend consultation with a pharmacist. There is one huge exception to all of these rate control options, and it is patients who present with an ECG like this. We have an irregularly irregular rhythm without discernible atrial activity, so it is a fib, but the QRS complex is wide and without a classic left or right bundle branch morphology. And the rate is extremely rapid, about 192 beats per minute. What is this an example of? This is pre-excited AFib, that is AFib occurring in the context of Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, in which the irregularly timed chaotic atrial impulses are sending signals predominantly down the accessory pathway, bypassing the AV node altogether. So using medications that work by slowing AV conduction, that's not going to help here, and in fact, there is both theoretical and empirical evidence that the acute use of AV nodal blocking drugs in such patients can trigger ventricular fibrillation. So what do we do? Once again, all AV nodal blocking meds are contraindicated acutely. For rate and or rhythm control, the meds of choice are procanamide or ibutilide, which slow conduction down the accessory pathway. Because of the potential that these patients can develop VFib, even spontaneously, or shock due to the extremely fast rates, keep the defibrillator at the bedside until some degree of rate control has been established. These patients all warrant a cardiology consult, with the urgency depending on the patient's stability, as judged by ventricular rate, blood pressure, symptoms, and comorbidities. And you should have a low threshold for electrical cardioversion. After rate control, the next question in acute AFib to consider is the patient's anticoagulation plan, which consists of two separate questions. Does the patient need anticoagulation? And if so, which anticoagulant is most appropriate? As with all decisions in medicine, anticoagulation decisions should be based on a risk-benefit assessment. The benefit from anticoagulation can be estimated from a clinical prediction rule called the chads vask score, which predicts the risk of stroke in patients with and without anticoagulation. The potential harm from anticoagulation can be estimated from a clinical prediction rule called the has bled score, which predicts the risk of a major bleed. In my experience, the chads vask score is very commonly used by clinicians, while the has bled score is not. The latter just has not been widely accepted. So let's just focus on the chads vask score. There are eight characteristics to look for. Each one gets one point, except the first A and S, which each get two points, hence the subscript to after those letters in the acronym. C stands for congestive heart failure. H is for hypertension. The first A is age of 75 or higher. D for diabetes. S for stroke or TIA. V for other vascular disease, such as peripheral arterial disease. The second A is for age 65 to 74. And SC stands for sex characteristic, which means that female patients get one point, though some clinicians don't think being female should give a point if there are no other risk factors for stroke, since relatively young, otherwise healthy females have a similar stroke risk as males. But overall, the higher the total number of points for a patient with AFib, the higher their risk of stroke. From this, one can follow a very general approach to determine if a patient should be on anticoagulation. The following sex-specific recommendations are based on recently updated joint AHA and ACC guidelines from 2019. The sex-specific differentiation has not been universally adopted, and many non-cardiologists are not even aware of this update. For male patients, a score of zero means no anticoagulation is generally recommended, while it is for a score of two or more. Of score of 1, 
means the clinician should use their clinical judgment, which also means having a shared decision-making conversation with the patient. For female patients, these values are all shifted by one point. So a score of zero or one means no anticoagulation, two means use clinical judgment, and three or more means yes to anticoagulation. Now you may wonder, if female sex gives a point on the chads vask score that not everyone agrees with, and if the most recent professional society guidelines for anticoagulation shift the RECs by a point for female patients, why don't cardiologists just simplify this by removing female sex from the score and giving all patients the same recommendations irrespective of sex? I honestly don't know the answer to that question. If I ever find a reliable explanation, I'll post it as a pinned comment. Other factors to consider when making a decision about whether to initiate anticoagulation, the concurrent use of antiplatelet meds, which will increase the risk of bleeding, if the patient has other potential indications for anticoagulation, such as a history of venous thromboembolism, is there a planned cardioversion, and of course, there are also all the general anticoagulation contraindications to consider, such as recent surgery or a recent hemorrhagic stroke. When it comes to choosing a specific anticoagulant, a DOAC, also known as a NOAC, such as a Pixaban, is recommended over warfarin in all patients except those with mechanical heart valves who should be anticoagulated with warfarin already, and those with moderate to severe mitral stenosis who should also be treated with warfarin. Patients with end-stage renal disease should be treated with either warfarin or Pixaban specifically. Also keep in mind that for acutely ill inpatients, it may be necessary to treat them with heparin in the short term instead of an oral anticoagulant if they may need to come on and off anticoagulation for procedures. As implied earlier, not every patient who presents to the ED with AFib needs to be admitted. Indications for admission include hypotension, a concurrent heart failure exacerbation, concurrent known or suspected new onset ischemia, systemic embolization such as a new stroke or TIA, inadequate rate control achievable in the ED with oral meds alone, and a plan for urgent cardioversion with an inability to do so in the ED. One final note. If the patient appears to convert back to sinus on telemetry, obtain a repeat ECG. Although that might sound obvious, I've seen more than one intern or resident or even attending neglect to do this. However, repeating the ECG confirms the new rhythm is actually sinus, as opposed to something like atrial flutter with fixed AV block. It conclusively documents the conversion in the chart, and it will also look for evidence of acute ischemia, which might have been absent or difficult to discern on ECG at rapid heart rates.